it's not usually this quiet. But there was quite a few meeting back there earlier and so forth. And I know y'all are tired and you're ready for a nap. It's been a long day and the snow's coming tomorrow. And now it's a question of when. So David's got to get all his wood up, right? Before it gets too bad. Well, we're glad you're here tonight and chose. Yeah, Gina's singing, I'm free, I'm free, free at last. She got to take off that orange jumpsuit. She's wearing, wearing a nice Marshfield Church of Christ uh, t shirt, and it's just awesome. Yeah, it's good to have Terry and, and Gina back with us. Y'all been locked up for how long now? It's been six weeks, eight weeks? Six weeks. Amazing. Well, we're going to let we're going to let Kevin deal with the sick list. So if you've got somebody on the sick list, you can go back there and tell him or make you a little note. Uh, we're going to dive into Mark just as soon as we can start with the prayer, and we want to continue because we want to get through as much as Mark one as we can, and get ready for Mark chapter two, if at all possible. And also, we want to talk about the importance of what the Scripture says relating to the baptism of the Holy Spirit as mentioned in our last study, and we'll go right there in just a moment. Before we do that, uh, Luther, would you lead us in prayer? Okay. Yeah, I think we had that on the, on the list, but uh, he's got that on his list. Uh, his Uncle Frank passed away. Thank you, Terry, for bringing that up. We'll make sure it gets on, on our prayer list. Again. And your mom run to recovery, too. All right. So, Luther, go ahead and offer a prayer for us. Would you bow with me, please? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've blessed us with. Lord, we uh, beg of you to please forgive us of any trespasses that we may have, have done, those known and unknown. And we ask you to please give us the strength that we need to forgive others who have trespassed against us. Lord, we know that our, our prayer list is long, we also know that you are a mighty and powerful God. And if it be your will, please return them to their help so they can help us to grow your kingdom for this world and for the next. We ask you, Lord, a special blessing upon Rick as he brings us a lesson that we will be able to absorb it and that we'll be able to bring it into our daily lives. And Lord, those that are Help us to be able to come together tonight in this worship. All of the police, the fire, and the military uh, keep us safe. A special blessing upon them. And this we pray in your, cry, in your Son, holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Luther. Uh, as we know, Mark 1 starts out in verse 1, the very beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. The Messiah, the Son of God, one anointed from God to save the world. And of course, that message was important to relate. And so Jesus had to make preparations to make sure that after he left this earth, that that gospel would continue. And in Mark chapter 1, we know particularly he calls, uh, if you can use that terminology, he selects uh, two men that are going to serve as his disciples sometimes they're called apostles can anybody tell me who those two are yeah there you go and so we have verse 16 simon and andrew and then later on he sees james and who john and these people would play an important role in accomplishing the mission related to the gospel of jesus christ and, of course, before Jesus appears on the scene, we've got John the Baptist out there, and he is different. And what's he dressed in? Campbell's hair, camel's hair, and what's his diet? Someone said if I could go on a locust diet, I'd lose a lot of weight because it's protein. probably would. It'd be fasting for me because I wouldn't be eating one of them. But that's an interesting diet. But it wasn't about his dress or his 
diet, what was the real significance of John the Baptist? Forerunner of Christ. He was a messenger preparing the way for Jesus. And in doing so, he preached that way to make straight the path, prepare the way of the Lord is quoted in Isaiah. And then we learn about folks who would come out to the Jordan confessing their sins. And what were they being, uh, or what was happening to them? They're being baptized. And it was a baptism of what? Repentance for remission of sin. Would, would this be a valid baptism after Christ went to the cross and Peter preached the gospel for the first time to the Jews in Acts chapter 2? No. We know that because of what reason? Because of the book of Acts. Those baptized under John's baptism were baptized again. And it's also interesting, I, I, we didn't dwell on this too much, but you've got the Pharisees. And those guys were, were the elite of the religious Jews in this day and time. They were the legalists of the law. They considered themselves those who were on target, and everybody else was what? Messed up, to say the least. And so they uh, have problems with what's going on, and, and we'll see that more unfold as we get into their dealings with Jesus. But John was baptizing, and that was not, though, his main purpose. We see his main purpose revealed in John 1, verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which does what? What would John the Baptist, baptism of repentance for remission of sins, be without Jesus? Essentially worthless. Because it was only Christ and his sacrifice that could ultimately give man what even the law could not. And what was that? Take away sin. Take away sin. So it all centered on Jesus and the man that was coming after John. And as you look at verse 31 of John 1, well, let's go back to verse 30. He says, This is he whom I, uh, whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And obviously he was before him because where was Jesus in the beginning? So the world, beginning with God. That's John 1. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so he was there before. So John understood that. And then verse 31, I did not know him, but he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And then Mark 1, verse 8, Indeed, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit. And from there, we got people who read this verse and they'll run all over the world saying, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're going to know it. How are you going to know it? According to some of these false teachers. You're going to jump up and down, roll down through the aisles. You're going to speak in gibberish and they'll call it tongues. Or you're going to have dreams and, and see visions that you're going to tell everybody about that make absolutely no sense. And I don't mean to ridicule those people, but they're under a false notion. Look at John 1, verse 33. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize the water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending... And remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Did you notice in this passage, it doesn't say everybody? Now, everybody will benefit and receive a benefit from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you'll notice it doesn't say everybody, does it? Well, let's go to Acts 1, verses 1 through 5. And you know, he pours out his spirit on all flesh. This is Joel 1, for example. All Americans are going to receive a stimulus check. 
What is that really saying? Did all Americans receive a stimulus check? Is the statement false then? Or is it a way of describing an action taking place on a specific group? It's a generalization of the, con uh, of the statement or uh, of the action. The action is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. How did all flesh benefit from that Holy Spirit? Run through the preaching of the gospel. Keep that in mind as we look at this. But in Acts 1, verses 1 through 5, we actually have the fulfillment of what is stated here in John chapter 1, as well as Mark, that we've been looking at. So if you would, turn your Bibles over to, to Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to get a volunteer here. <laughs> Luther, if you'd hand out the um, microphone to Jeff. Jeff, could you read that for us? Acts 1, 1 through 5. And as he does so, note carefully who is being spoken to and what is being promised to those to whom Jesus is speaking. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, did we read verse 5 somewhere else? Where did we see those words at? Look at it again. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Upon whom you see the Spirit descending remaining in him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So there is a promise made, and it's reiterated again, and notice it calls it in verse 4 the promise of who? promise of the Father, and who to whom is the promise given? That's extremely important. Okay, we're dealing with the 11. How do we know that? Well, what's happened to Judas? He went out and hanged himself, didn't he? Now look at verse 1 of Acts 1 again. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the, what's the word? Apostles, whom he had chosen. To whom, still speaking of the apostles, he also presented himself alive after suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by who? the apostles during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, the New King James says, and whenever you have a pronoun, where's my English teachers at, Kathy? When you have a pronoun, it goes back to what? Previous subject or, in this case, it's, it's a noun. Who's the noun? It's the apostles. So this is a promise made to the apostles. And so he declares that they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Probably most everybody here knows that, but yet people will teach that the Holy Spirit baptism is for everyone and it's still in force today. How do we know it's not in force today? Yeah, there you go. And that's the purpose of it. But if, if I want to really zero down uh, on showing that this is not the baptism that's in force today, 
What one passage could I go to? Ephesians 4.4. 4. And what's it say, Terry? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's a better way to do it, not three. One baptism. Okay, if there's one baptism, what is it? In water for remission of sins. And how do we know that's in four? Because from looking throughout the book of Acts all the way through the writings of the Paul, Romans 6, on and on, what baptism is he talking about? When Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized, Mark 16, 15, 16, shall be saved, was he talking about Holy Spirit baptism or water baptism? Water baptism. And so that is the one baptism by the time Paul wrote Ephesians 4 that was in place. And then, of course, we can do other studies to show that that is true. But that's just a, a very important way to, to understand that this was a promise made to the apostles. What happens in Acts 2? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, something occurs. What occurs there? They're all together in one place, and what happens, Larry? Yeah, there appeared to them divided tongues or cloven tongues of fire and set upon each of them, verse 3, and they were all filled with what? Now, once again, the question needs to be asked, and a very diligent Bible student will want to, to make sure they know, and because it says, and they were all fear, filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 4. Well, who are the they? So we go back and look for our nouns. It's a subject, and who do we find? And we've got to go all the way back to verse 26, chapter 1. And what does that say? Somebody want to read it for us? Acts 1, 26. Larry, go ahead. Yeah, Acts chapter 1, verse 26. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And then verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost fully come, they were all with one accord. Who was with all in one accord? The apostles. There will be those who will try to teach you that it goes back to the upper room in verse 12, and uh, particularly verse 14, they all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers to try to prove that they all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that would be a corruption of what? Of the word. Because it's not referring to those, it's referring to the 11 apostles. Who was the promise made to? The apostles. Who received it? The apostles. And what was the purpose of the Holy Spirit? As Janet's already pointed out, if you go to John 13, 14, 15, and 16, the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to guide them into all truth bring all things to their remembrance. Who? The apostles. Same context. Talking to those specifically chosen to carry forth the gospel to the world. And that is with reference to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But as you open Mark up, it, there unfolds for us the central focus, Jesus came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Did Jesus need to be baptized because of his sins? No. Why do you need to be baptized, Dan? Submissive act wasn't because of his sins. or he, It was fulfilling all righteousness. Setting an example for us. And if you wanted to know what little green box is there, it's in reference to, notice it calls Jesus came from Nazareth. And um, at Matthew 2, 22 and 23 tells why we often hear of Jesus being from Nazareth. But I don't want to really take the time for that because we want to look at what happens to Jesus in verse 10 of Mark 1. Immediately, Mark uses that word a lot, immediately coming up from the water, he, speaking of Christ, saw what happening? 
Or was it Christ? Well, let's look at the context. Who was it? Immediately coming up from water, he saw the heavens parting, the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Who saw what? What do we have to do to get an answer? Say it again. Yeah, there you go. You look at the context, so it's always important. So it came to pass in the day, in those days, that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up, up from the water, he was it John or Jesus? Saw the heavens parting, the Spirit descending upon him like a dove, and the voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. So what is being seen here? That's the significant part. There you go. The deity of Christ is confirmed. And the voice of heaven said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so what, is, what action did Jesus do in order to please God? Or was it even considered? He had to do what the Father wanted him to do. And the relationship of the deity is confirmed. You are my beloved son. And if you're a son of God, it's not an ordinary situation, is it, in this case? Most importantly, it was pleasing to God. Now, any questions over the baptism of John? Probably you all are familiar with that. Let's move on then to what happens immediately. From baptism to immediately, there's an action taking place. What is it? <coughs> the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And what's going to happen in that wilderness? going to be tempted. What happens when a new babe comes out of the watery grave of baptism? Satan. He's Satan's going to do hold the same thing, isn't he? Not in the same way necessarily because what tempts one may not tempt another, but he's going to put Jesus to the test. Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, Luke chapter 4 verse 1. And what's going to occur there? He's going to spend 40 days and then be tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. And what kind of wild beast you got out there in the wilderness around in that area of, of the Sea of Galilee? Jordan area. Do you have lions? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure about tigers, but... It's, it's good enough to say lions and tigers and what? That tells us there are things bigger than we are, or maybe to tell us that we're not the top of the food chain. And we do know that David uh, himself made claim to killing what kind of animals? Lion and the bear. Lion and the bear. So there were wild beasts out there that, uh, were to be, uh, that he mentions, which is worthy consideration. And the worst beast out there is who? Satan. Satan. And you notice in Luke chapter 4, verse 5, you see the interchangeability of Satan and the devil. Then the devil takes him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And what's basically Satan going to say to Jesus? Hey, they're yours. I got the power. Yeah, he's like saying, I dare you. I dare you. If you really are who you claim to be, I dare you. And obviously, because it is a temptation, and it's clear that he is tempted by it. So Satan is using something that did touch a nerve with Jesus, correct? And that's, that's important to understand. That these are things that did tempt Jesus. And that's why in Hebrews 4, verse 15, we read the words, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points 
tempted as we are, yet without sin. Have you ever been in the midst of a temptation, something tempting you, and you, you just stop and think, you know, Jesus understands what I'm going through. What happens if we are facing temptation thinking we're all alone? It's easy to give in. And how can we ever think that God's not looking? But also if we think we're all alone, we get into the, nobody cares about me. And what happens when we reach the point where we think, nobody cares about me? Discouragement. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Here I am doing all this and nobody cares. How many of y'all been there? Is there anybody here that hasn't? We get there, don't we? It's something we face. And, you know, we can rationalize and say, well, no, it never happens to me because I always know God's there. Well, we do mentally assess, but is there, knowing something mentally, is that the same as dealing with it emotionally? How did Paul describe his struggle with sin? It's a war. It's a war. I know what to do, I know what's right, but then I turn around and what Paul says. Huh? He had to fight the fight. He was struggling. And, and if you think about Jesus in that, well, he's out there. Uh, what's going on physically with his body, Dan? So he had a physical war going on inside, didn't he? And then here Satan comes along, and what's the, what's the, one of the things that he offers Jesus? Hey, we can understand that one. Maybe more than thinking about being offered all the kingdoms of the world. But when you think about Jesus having to go through this, and it's interesting, who was out there with Jesus, human-wise? No one. And, and why would we be a target if we're feeling all alone? Or why would we be a target if we isolate ourselves from all of our brethren? We'd all be alone, feel like there's no support. Do we need each other as Christians? Because if we stand out there by ourselves, we're a target. And you think about some of the research that's been done. Studies have been done in, in the church. Um, Brother Flavio Yakely was one who did some of these studies. There's been others. But they've learned, and it's, it's an obvious learning, but they, they check numbers and, and do surveys, and they find out that a person who attends the assemblies three times a week is very less likely, and I forget the percentage, but they're less likely to fall away than a person who attends only one assembly. What's happened with COVID in the church all across America? If you've read the Christian Chronicle or other, other Brotherhood publications, what has happened? People quit attending because of COVID, and then what occurred after that? They don't come back. And then maybe for a while they claim COVID, but then pretty soon there's no more claims. I had my physician tell me actually how I was dealing with the COVID and everything, being more isolated than normal. And uh, she said that she sees over her patients that the ones that are religious and attend are more able to handle Oh, that's great to hear because that, that's been proven by studies. And they also, and they know that a person living alone and then maybe they were active and then don't or, or, or quit being active with other people, what happens to them? 
they're actually more likely to get physically sick because we tend to isolate ourselves to the point we turn inward, whereas when we're with others, we're looking outward, which is so important. So verse 13 of Luke says, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him. And from there, of course, Luke, doesn't he tell us that he'll never bother Jesus again? That's not what it reads, does it, Janet? He departed from him until what? An op opportune time. And that's our life history, isn't it? Because it's the same today. What does Satan do? He waits for opportune time. Do you mean that even our elders are tempted by sin? Do you mean to tell me that our deacons are tempted by sin? The preacher. Did you hear about the preacher? You're going to ask me tonight, what tempts you, Rick? Probably the same thing that tempts most everybody else. And if you say chocolate cake, you're probably thinking, you've given in too much to that sin. Now we are. We are tempted. And it is, it is a challenge. But moving on, Mark 1. Jesus, in verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus comes to Galilee. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now what boggles my mind is there are people out there that teach that when Jesus came, he saw that they couldn't establish his kingdom, and so he decided to put that off until way, way in the future. And, and someday he's going to come back and he's going to establish his kingdom, and we'll live and reign in the kingdom of Jesus. What is wrong with that? From this verse right here. He did establish it. And that makes sense because he's come to Galilee. What's he preaching? And wouldn't God have known that the, there was going to be no place for a kingdom if that was going to be the truth? So why have Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom? Just Yeah, it doesn't make sense, does it? Very good point, Kathy. And, and keep that in mind, because but, and I don't mean to pick on folks, but when I hear things like this being taught on a regular basis, it just it makes my hair stand up on my ears and inside my nose. Continue, yeah, one after another. And it just doesn't even make sense, because Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is very essential to our salvation. In fact, in Mark 1.15, we read and saying the time is what? Fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. And what's connected to that kingdom that's at hand? Repent and believe in the gospel. And what does that word at hand mean? There's a little definition here I wanted to include. It literally means to be within reach. Now, does it make any sense to then say that, well, Jesus realized he couldn't establish the kingdom, and therefore he put it off till the millennium that's coming later that they're talking about? It doesn't make sense. Mark 14, 42, he'll use the word, it's in reference to betrayal. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Dan, was Jesus betrayed very soon after this? Yes, it's at hand. The doctor comes out and says, I'm sorry you have cancer and you're, you're going to um, need to make preparations because your death is at hand. What is he saying to us? And I hope he doesn't say that to you. 
It's going to be imminent. It's soon. It's time is soon to be fulfilled. Well, because it's going to be fulfilled, Jesus has preparation to do. So in, he needs to enlist some apostles. And what are the apostles going to do in Acts 2? They're going to go everywhere preaching the gospel. Spread the word. So verse 16, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee. Who does he see here? Simon and Andrew, Simon and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. And, and who were they? Fishermen. fishermen. And what kind of fishermen were they? You know, we got folks that go fishing today, and they take their poles out there, and and they'll try to go when they can, and they'll fish, and they may bring home one or two, maybe ten, or whatever the limit is. And these are professional fishermen. And there's something here in this passage, and Roy probably can tell us real quick. Why do we know, Roy, these are professional fishermen? They use the nets. They're casting the net into the sea. That tells us they're after the catch that would become marketable. And then it says, clearly, they were fishermen. That was their profession. But then Jesus said to them, I'm going to change your profession. What does he say? Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Isn't it interesting how Mark puts that, I will make you become fishers of men? Is he saying, I'm going to force it on you, or is he saying something else? Roy? He's, he's, he's going to teach them. And if you have a skill and you want to share that with your ch children, and you say, okay, I'm going to make you become just like me, and you're going to be able to build this house like I can build a house, or work on a car, or whatever. It, it is, he's going to put them through a process, in other words, that's going to allow them to become fishers of men. And, and notice who he is he's, he's calling Simon and Andrew. And they did what? Verse 18. They left their nets. And, and there's Mark's word again. Immediately left their nets and followed him. Well, what's the problem with them immediately leaving their nets? Yeah, were they the only ones involved? But it does show their trust in who? In, in Jesus. And verse 19 is interesting because we read, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat doing what? Mending their nets. And so... Mending nets is pretty important this day and time because if you know if there's a hole in the net, what are fish going to do? They're going to, to go right through, as Gina said. You know, that's a lesson for life, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I worked as a manager for a computer company, had my own business, Zenith Television Dealership in Fayetteville, and I was, I was service manager for Computerland for a number of years. And I learned something from what you read right here. If you got a hole or a problem, fix it, or otherwise you're going to do what? If you let that hole stay in the net, you're going to lose your profitability. So the best thing to do if you got a hole, a problem, what do you want to do quickly? Because really these nets aren't any good until what happens? Fish get away. They're not good until you fix them. And if you got a problem, the best thing to do is what? Take it, Take it to God, of course. That's right, Gina. We pray about it first, but then whatever we can do that is required of us, we work to make sure we try to fix the problem. Many times that does mean prayer. Well, verse 20 says immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat. And who did he leave their father with? hired servants, and went after him. So they were making sure that father didn't starve to death, right? That the business continued. I think that's interesting uh, that we read that. It shows that uh, 
Jesus wasn't wanting them to just destroy those around them. He wanted them to continue in doing the things that were right. And which brings us to verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue, and what did he do? Teach. Teach. Went into the synagogue, and he taught. And why would he be in the synagogue teaching? That's where the people believed in God, where the Jews were at. And, of course, Jesus is focused on who? He's focused on those Jews, isn't he? And so he goes into the synagogue and he teaches. What would Jesus be teaching? You know, he's come there to preach the gospel, so what would he be teaching? He's teaching the coming, the coming of the kingdom. And what would he teach, though? What would he prove to them that the kingdom is coming? Well, yeah. He would be teaching from the Old Testament, wouldn't he? They would be reading from the prophets. The prophets that prophesied of the coming of the Messiah, the fulfillment of that, what was involved in that, also the promise of the kingdom and the promises made to Abraham. The list could go on. And so Jesus had to know what? The Old Testament, didn't he? And he would have been capable of teaching that. And that's just something significant to think about because oftentimes people think, well, Jesus was just, just saying something different and new to them, but what was he trying to do for them? They might have taught something different and new. We see things revealed, but what's he doing? He's the word. That's a good point. He's the word. And so he, had, he could use just like Paul or any others in that synagogue. Because what would they do in the synagogue? Are, have, are you familiar with the synagogue? Our time's up. But what, what went on in the synagogue? Well, they would read the old law. And so then they would offer people a chance to speak. And when they stood up, the law had been read. What could have Jesus have done just like Paul would have done? Explain it. Wouldn't it have been wonderful to be there to hear Jesus explaining the scriptures? You know, I think as a teacher, I teach and I, I go back sometimes and listen to what I've said and I go, why did I say that? And a lot of times just how I said it. Or that didn't come out clear. I should have been much more clear. But imagine listening to Jesus because we're going to learn when Jesus teaches, what does he do for people? He astonishes them. Teaches as one having what, Clayton? Having authority. Appreciate your listening tonight. We'll continue to mark one, finish it next week, Lord willing, and then move into chapter two.
this last time, didn't I? Right there to work. All right. So everybody's ready. I don't have a whole lot tonight on the announcements. The um, pretty much the jail ministry is open back up, thankfully. I was afraid it was going to take the rest of the month, but got it done early. Um, thank you. We want to thank everybody for the fellowship dinner, the ones that prepared food. That was amazing. Um, Blaine Overton, Jerry Letterman's um, nephew-in-law has has passed away. So keep Jerry in there. Jerry needs a lot of prayers between that and his surgery and everything else he's going through. And Terry told me that uh, Frank Luttler, his uncle that had the stroke, did pass away. He actually passed away last week. We just didn't have a chance to get Terry to find out. And I'll touch on these. The men's, uh, men's business meeting is uh, March 6th, 4 to 5.30. They encourage all men to attend. Gospel meeting on, at El Dorado Springs Church of Christ. Adam Moore will be preaching at 7 on the weeknights. That's from March 6th to the 10th. March 20th is the BBS meeting after Sunday evening of worship. Uh, if you plan to assist, you know, please, play, please plan to attend that meeting. Uh, tentative week for the BBS is July 11th through the 15th. And this to remind, keep it in your mind, is March 17th, Fairhaven's grocery pickup. The barrel over here is full. This one's not quite half full. So that's about all I've got. Want to bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight to thank you for everything you give us. Uh, roof over our heads, or we all have a place to live, a roof over our heads, and uh, friends, family, and loved ones in our lives. And, this wonderful church family to brothers and sisters to uh, come together and uh, find out more of your word and pray that uh, they, we will be able to keep that word in mind as we go through our daily lives that we will try to enact that and always act to, always strive to be a better Christian today than we were yesterday. And never be perfect, and you know that. We know that we can come to you if we do stumble and, and uh, repent of that sin and ask for your forgiveness, and we promise that you will forgive and forget. And uh, the, the biggest gift we can thank you for is your son coming down and sacrificing himself as he did on the cross for, for our salvation and forgiveness of our sins. Uh, and that chance of eternal happiness in heaven with you and him. And uh, we ask all this in his name. Amen. Revelation, the 19th chapter, and verses 16. And he was on his throne, and on his thigh a name was written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 266, I think. 266. Majesty, worship his majesty unto Jesus, be all power, glory, and praise. Everybody know that song? Two six six. Anybody know that? Majesty, worship his majesty unto Jesus, be all glory, power, and praise. Majesty, kingdom of authority. Oh, his throne, 
song will be 926. You want to go ahead and mark that. <clears throat> Good evening. Man, it's great to see everybody out. Makes me have a smile on my face to be this part of the family. I'm going to ask you some questions tonight, and you don't have to respond, but I do want you to focus on them and think about what they mean in your life. Have you got everything that you want? Do you have everything you need? How much stuff do we have that we don't need? As I get older, of course, my needs change. And as young people know, you, you're in the midst of the, I call it accumulation stage, where you're, you're gaining stuff every day. Well, I'm past that point. I'm really not. In fact, I should be going the other way. I need to be getting rid of a lot of stuff that I don't need or don't use. But anyway. <coughs> I wanted to share with you from Matthew 7, or 6, starting in verse 31. And it, Jesus was on the, this is his Sermon on the Mount, and it says, Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we clothe ourselves? How many of us going through our daily lives first thing in the morning what's on your mind I have to say what's going to be on the table next round I'm sorry I, I'm a foodie person and then what clothes am I going to wear for the day and what shall I drink these are our daily goals or privileges of the things that is going to happen in our daily lives. And in verse 32 he says, For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek, for your heavenly fathers know what you need all these things. God knows. And then in 33, but seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You know, putting our faith and trust in God, that he will provide for us, not what we need or what we've got to have, but what we need every day. You know, we, we think about the... the Call it the model prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. How many of us, especially in this country, absolutely have all we want to eat every day? I don't know of anybody, and I, if you go hungry, it's by your choice. It's not because the refrigerator's empty. Yeah, it might cost a little more, but we're going to eat. I once heard a guy say he forgot to eat one day, and I thought, huh? What's wrong with you? Forget to eat? Golly gee, that just don't happen. I mean, not on me anyway. 
But as we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto us. He's going to take care of us as long as we keep seeking him. And then 34, I call it my kicker verse. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care enough for itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. We get so wrapped up in physical things that really don't matter. Because God, if we're seeking him and serving him in our lives, he's going to take care of us. If there's anyone here tonight that has not accepted the Lord. This is an invitation for you all to come forward and, and make that concordant confession to, and take on Christ in baptism. Or if you need the prayers of this congregation, or if you need Bible study, there are so many here that will step up to the plate and guide you anything you all need. Would you all please stand and sing this song of invitation? Jesus is standing by the call, friendless, forsaken, redeemed by all, walking in the sudden call. What will you do with me? What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, oh friend, what will he do with me? Jesus, I give thee my heart today. Jesus, I'll follow thee all the way. Gladly to pain thee, will you say, this will I do with Jesus. What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be as you know, friend. What will he do with me? with me please holy god almighty father we're again very thankful father that you have allowed us to gather there this evening father to learn another portion of your word father sing songs of praise to you father to do those things that we pray that bring you honor and glory father the fellowship with one another and, and grow stronger through the strength we have together serving you. Father, we're thankful for the answered prayers on so very many. We continue to ask your healing hands and blessings on those that's in need, whether it's spiritual, physical, emotional. Father, we're mindful of those in, that go out through the world and spread the gospel and, and serve you in other countries and serve you here. Father, well, we pray that you'll be with each and every one of those Bible studies and those individuals that's hearing the gospel, that they may obey it before it's eternally too late. Father, well, we're mindful of the jail ministry, and we're thankful that we're able to go back in there this Sunday. And Father, we pray that you'll be with everybody in this congregation that's praying for that effort and those that's baking cookies and serving desserts and stuff and father that were for the jailers we're mindful father those that's hearing the gospel that have obeyed it continue to be at them help us to teach 
to teach them to observe all things as you've commanded. Father, we know that at times we sin and fall short of your glory and we beg forgiveness. We also pray that you would strengthen us, that we wouldn't repeat those sins, that we'd always strive to be forgiving of others so that you would forgive us our sins. Father, please be with us as we depart this evening. Help us to be a beacon of light for those around us and not a blotch on your son's precious name. And it is in his name that we offer this prayer. Amen. <laughs>